Hey, good morning to you. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today on the broadcast. I'm uh, happy that you're, uh, you're with us. And uh, for those of you who haven't been with us, we're doing a series from the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5. So, our house is about 100 yards, basically, from our mailbox. We live back off the street. And a few days ago, I was out checking the mail and walking back down our driveway, and I noticed one of the letters said, uh, congratulations to you, Michael Haley, uh, for being a, we have, no, it was this, congratulations to you, Michael Haley, we have a special reward for being a member in good standing. And of course, there was no return address on it that you could identify, so I figured it was junk mail, and when I opened it up, it was. However, as I walked back to the house, I couldn't get away from that phrase, a member in good standing. Everyone likes to be a member in good standing, don't they? Today, we're coming to the Beatitude. It's the fourth one in our series. And I said, found in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 6, Jesus said this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now get this, righteousness here is a very simple word that just means in good standing with God, right standing with God, like that, kind of like the, the verbiage on that junk mail that I got. So the question becomes, how do we go about getting in a right standing with the maker and sustainer of all that is? And by the way, don't forget that when Jesus made this statement, he was living under the old covenant, under the law, to people who were living in pre-cross days. So for us to understand what he said correctly, we have to interpret it in light of grace and the new covenant on this side of the cross, right? Because that's where we are today. That's where we're living, under grace. All right, to understand righteousness and a right standing with God... Several things, uh, we, we have to understand several things. And the first one is this, we have to understand the salvation issue. Uh, everyone talks about salvation, but I fear many miss the true meaning of it. Now through the centuries, God made a number of covenants with mankind, but surely the most significant covenant is what we call salvation. However, in my opinion, it also is the most misunderstood of the covenants, and let me show you why. Here's one of the greatest words you will not find in the New Testament, though it is a Greek word that was prevalent in Jesus' day. The word is syntheki. Now, this is really good. Watch this. During the days of the writing of the Gospels and the Epistles, it was common uh, this word was a common word used to describe a covenant among the people. In fact, it means a mutual agreement between two people and two parties. For instance, let's say two people start a business, and one agrees to front the money and the other agrees to, to develop the product. They would enter into a covenant which would bind them, bind each party to fulfill their end of the deal. Like in Deuteronomy 28, where God instructs Israel that if they do what He wants at all times, in other words, if they keep His rules and commands, then He will give them what they want, which was big-time blessings. That was a suntheki, the old covenant. Of course, as with all covenants, if one party failed to keep their end of the agreement, the covenant was broken and the deal was off. Now, naturally, God always kept his part of the arrangement. But the people, well, that was a different story, right? Because the people in the Old Testament failed a lot, which led to fear and shame and consequences that often included what they believed to be God's judgment and punishment. Now, fast forward to the days after Jesus died and the new covenant came to pass. All of a sudden, something wonderfully unique transpires because this new covenant was not called suntheki, but instead a new word was coined diatheki or diatheki. And diatheki means not an agreement between two, now watch this, but it is an agreement of one. 
In other words, the new covenant was not established as a mutual agreement with two parties involved, God and us. No. The new covenant, the salvation covenant, involves one party, and that party is God. God made up the arrangement. God established the rules and God set the parameters all by himself. And those parameters were basically uh, this. God gives us everything through his son Christ. Everything will be fulfilled in our lives through Jesus and it won't cost us one thing, yet we will receive all of the benefits. Now how about that? Isn't that just about the best thing ever? No pressure, no obligation, no soon just uh, just a, a covenant given to us by God. Listen, our relationship with God will never depend on us, on what we do and don't do. It will always depend on Him, the one who is faithful and the one who is true. Therefore, we need to get rid of this mindset that says the gospel of salvation is, okay, bud, keep your end of the bargain and God will keep his. We need to get rid of this kind of, Father, I will do this great thing if you'll do that great thing for me. And we need to stop working so hard at trying to develop this perfect relationship with him. Because as far as he is concerned, we already have a perfect relationship with him. Just relax, believe, trust, rest in the fact that the covenant maker is forever the covenant keeper. So we must understand the salvation issue to understand being in a right standing with God. But we also need to understand the sin issue. Because how in the world can we be in a right standing with God yet still have issues with sin, correct? And therein lies the problem. You see, the church most of us are familiar with or grew up with seems to have an unhealthy obsession with sin, in my opinion. We, listen, we are taught to be on guard because sin will come knocking when we least expect it, right? So we spend our lives watching out for sin, resisting sin, running from sin, confessing sin, and hopefully someday overcoming sin. In other words, it's all about sin. And with such an inordinate amount of attention on sin, is it any wonder that most church folks don't really feel righteous, don't really feel uh, a pure and holy? Listen to these words from Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says, For Christ also suffered once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Now, here's the deal. In God's eyes, sin is no longer an issue. In the Old Testament, it was. Everything was behavior-based and behavior-oriented. Obey the law and you were safe. Break the law and you were in trouble. And even some cases, put to death. But when Jesus went to the cross, he fulfilled the law. And when he did that, the sin issue was put to rest. Because Peter says in these verses, Jesus died once and for all to bring us to God. Something the law was never able to accomplish. Now look at that verse again. For Christ also suffered once for all. He died one time. That means he is the final sacrifice. There will never be another because there, do, there doesn't need to be another, right? And he died for all. That includes you and that includes me. And then look what happens as a result of that. Paul says this in Romans, For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and His gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin. Now get that. Will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Righteousness, being in good standing, being in a right standing with God, is His gift to us. And because of that gift we will triumph over sin. 
Now, does that mean we will never commit a sin again? Absolutely not. Some of you sinned already this morning. Some of you sinned uh, last night. All of us have sinned probably this past week. It doesn't mean we will never commit a sin again. It does mean, however, that sin cannot cause us to be ungraced or to become unrighteous or to take us out of right standing with God. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he wrongly assumed God would be angry, and so he hid from God. But instead, God came looking for him, didn't he? So that he could take his evening, regular evening walk with Adam. No condemnation for his disobedience, just grace for him and a fresh start. When Elisha was depressed and afraid, when he was angry and prayed to die, God sent an angel to feed him so that he might regain his strength. Now get this, no shame or blame for his failure. How about Peter? After Peter denied the Lord, Jesus, after he was resurrected, made sure to mention Peter by name. He even told the women at the tomb to make sure that Peter knew he was alive. No reference to Peter's denial and sin. It was a non-issue. Listen, what I'm saying is these people were giants in the Bible. Giants who made horrible and sinful choices. But in each instance, the love of God swallowed up their sins and their foolishness in one great gush of grace. So hey, what have you done that causes you to think God may be disappointed or perturbed or done with you? What is it? Whatever it is, you need to set it aside because that's what God has done. As absurd as it sounds, He has once and for all taken care of your sin issue. All right, to get a handle on righteousness, we must understand the salvation issue, the sin issue, and lastly, according to this beatitude, the hunger issue. Because Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever been really thirsty or really hungry? I have. You have too, right? Could, could that be what Jesus means here? Perhaps, I, I suppose. Or think about this. In sub-Saharan Africa about 25% of the population goes without adequate food and water. Many literally starve to death every day. Let's say that I put that question to them. Hey, you all, have you ever been hungry? Have you ever been thirsty? Do you think when they raise their hands in affirmation that it might mean something a little different than when we here in this country raise ours? So from culture to culture, there can easily be confusion and a disconnect about physical hunger and thirst. But watch this. There is also confusion and a disconnect about spiritual hunger and thirst. I watched a music video of a church service recently, I got to, and I got to listening to the lyrics of a couple of songs. Those songs were all about, I am hungry, hungry for God. More of you, Jesus. More of you. Fill me, Holy Spirit. I am thirsty. Send a revival. God, we need you to come. We need you to come down. God, we need you. Now, let me ask you another question. Have you ever sang songs with any of those kinds of lyrics? Or been taught to pray those things? Yeah, me too. I remember as a young preacher, I was taught to always stay hungry for God. Always be thirsting for more and more of Him. But let's think about that mindset for a moment. Now, if God is good and God is love, and He is, and if He desires to care for the needs of His children, and He does, does it make sense that He would leave us desperate and hungry and thirsty all the time? And that He would only be motivated to feed us when we gathered at His feet and begged for Him to do so, begged for our daily bread, and also when we included statements about how unworthy we are to be in His presence, or instead, 
because we are His children and because His riches are inexhaustible, would He not supply to us more than enough? I think the latter is true. In fact, I know it is from Scripture. Let me share an illustration I used in a previous series. See if you can identify with this. Have any of you ever had a picnic at the beach or the park when you were a kid? Did you ever do that with your family? Suppose you're having a picnic and you're a kid and with your family and, and you're, you're out at, at the beach and you've got a full spread. I mean, everything you love to eat is on this big table that the adults have set for you. Your favorite meat, all the salads, potatoes and veggies and desserts, lots of desserts. And the crazy, you got a crazy uncle sitting down at the end of the table. He's carving a big ham. Now, when it's time to eat, what happens? Well, everyone just starts filling their plate, right? I had a great family because they always let the kids go first. I went to a friend's uh, picnic one time and the adults got to go first. I like my family better. But anyway, everyone starts filling their plate. And you just, you, you load that sucker up, don't you, with everything you like, especially that dessert. Yes? And guess what? You can eat anything, anything you want, and you can eat as much as you want, right? The reason why is because this is your family, your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your cousins. But suppose that while you're eating, a homeless man walks up and he just stands there quietly, won't even look up kind of a thing. Finally, he does look up and speaks and says, you know, folks, I'm sure hungry and I'll be glad to clean up after all you folks if I might just have a plate. Now, first of all, he's basically begging. Secondly, he's asking to be your servant, to serve you. But as a little kid, you would be thinking, I don't, what, what's, what's the problem here? We have tons of food. Why doesn't he just sit down and dig in? So your crazy uncle down at the end of the table, jumps up and says, Why, sure you can, partner, sit right here. Uh, let me fill that plate up for you. Glad to have you. Now, here's the deal with that illustration. That homeless man sees himself as unworthy, as a beggar or a servant, not as a son or a family member. Would you agree? That's why he came basically begging. He sees himself as less than you and your family. Because watch. Your behavior will always reveal who you believe yourself to be in your heart. Now think about that. Your behavior will always reveal who you believe yourself to be in your heart. Now it would be weird, really, for any stranger to come crash your picnic, wouldn't it? Sure it would. It's not their event. It's not their family. That person doesn't have the same rights to your event as your family which illustrates the precise problem, and that is this. Now, stay with me here. So many people say they are sons and daughters of God. They say they have been born again. They say they have been made righteous by Jesus and are in a right or good standing with God. They say those things. However, they act and live and even come to church and sing as if they are a servant or a beggar. Does that make sense at all? Again, your behavior will always reveal who you believe yourself to be in your heart. Or as Solomon said in Proverbs, as a man thinks in his heart, as a woman thinks in her heart, so is he, so is she. Listen to these words of Jesus in in John chapter 6, referring to their physical hunger, the people gathered there were saying to him, Lord, give us more bread. We're hungry. Lord, give us more bread. In reply to that, Jesus says these words, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, here's how Webster's Dictionary defines the word never. Not ever, at no time, not in any degree, not under any condition. All right, with that in mind, let's try that verse again. I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will not ever at no time to any degree under any condition go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never at no time to any degree under any condition be thirsty. Now isn't it something that all these many years later, after Jesus said those words, Christians have never advanced beyond those early believers in this regard, in that we still build disciples today based on the false assumption that we must beg and plead and work hard to get more of something, when all the while God has put forth the effort to give us everything, including a right standing uh, with Him. So a person can actually spend his or her life seeking more when all the time what they are seeking is what they already have. So the good news for us on this side of the cross is we don't need to spend another second hungering and thirsting after God's righteousness. We've already been filled. But I'll tell you what we do need to do. What we do need to be hungry and thirsty for And that is the wisdom and the insight to understand what it truly means that we are now righteous. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Let me close with this. Speaking of food and picnics. Have you ever gone to, let's say, your grandmother's house or a favorite aunt's house for Sunday dinner or for a holiday meal like Thanksgiving? And she's prepared this massive spread for you. And her greatest joy in life is watching you eat it all, right? You can't leave anything on your plate when you go to grandma's house, right? Or your your favorite aunt's. And she's up refilling your plate. Whenever something runs out, she's up there refilling everyone's plate. And, And when she does, you protest, right? But you just keep on eating anyway, don't you? And then when you finally finish the meal... Your stomach is all bloated and extended out there, even sore because you ate so much. And what, how, does your, how, how does your react then? What, what, do you remember what you say? You say words like this, man, I'm such a pig. Or on your way home, you're going, why did I, why did I eat like that? Why do I do that? I just hate myself. Just kidding, but, but maybe not. But maybe you did say something like, Oh man, I am just stuffed. No, Grandma, I can't, I can't handle any more. I am just stuffed. Get this. This word filled with righteousness. Filled. It means gorged and stuffed. Now think about that. Jesus was saying, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall be gorged and stuffed with righteousness. <laughs> How good is that? Great, isn't it? Let's just thank Him for it right now. Could we? You pray. You just bow your heads with me and let me pray. God, we thank You that we've been made pure and righteous and whole. That we are in right standing with You today. And that we will be in right standing with You tomorrow and forever through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I hope that encouraged you a little bit. That's all the time I have for today. We're going to continue this study in the Beatitudes next week, the Lord willing. So I hope you'll join me then. If I can help you in any way, answer questions for you. Um, Surely today might have brought up some questions. I'll be happy to do that. If you have something I can pray about, I would love to be able to do that too. You can contact me on any social media venue, or you can go to our webpage, newdaychurchbrandon.org and shoot me an email, okay? Have a blessed and satisfyingly happy week, you righteous one. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.